So let me do that here. Previous attempt. Oh, it's because of my the dice loading that I've done. Um, because I accessed it as an instructor trying to generate a question. It thinks uh, there is an attempt, although um, I will still get full 20 minute time limit because the test to start hasn't opened it, the, ti the timer hasn't started yet. So let me start this, start the timer and work through the question. Um, Start and I actually remember what question it was because it's such a common scenario you see this in class. Like if you got this question, I hope you thank your lucky stars that you got this question because you know you, this is a setup that you have seen so many times in this class. You've seen this setup in the dynamics lab, and uh, if you see this again in your timed assessment, I hope you are able to do it because. Really, it's a one particular setup you have seen multiple times. So yeah, all these descriptions, poorly messless, all that stuff that allows you to simplify certain things. It says describe the forces on the free body diagram for mass and small m and big m. You can in forces that are equally magnitude. Okay, so let me draw those free body diagrams. And and these free body diagrams are now related to each other. It's not a single object the free body diagram anymore. So I have free body diagram for the small hanging mass m. There's always going to be gravity there. So you start out with the gravity and you think through, okay, what else is touching this mass? The string is touching it. So there must be a tension force upward. Okay, I think that's it. Um, let me draw the free body diagram for the big mass m on the table. And it said uh, ignore any frictional forces, right? So there's always going to be gravity, big mass m times g. And because I know it's not accelerating downward, there must be no more force upward that's exactly balancing this out. And as I think through it, well, it's got to be accelerating to the left. So where's left toward the force? I look at the uh, string that must be pulling it left toward with tension force. And there's the question of, is this the same tension force as the tension force that I labeled before? And the answer here is, yes, it's the same tension force. Because the pulley is massless, one, you'll see a full explanation for this in like a month and a half. And two, because we are ignoring any frictional forces. The pulley is frictionless. So that's what allows us to say these are the same tension force. And again, until like um, two, a month and a half from now when we'll finally be able to deal with a pulley that's not massless, until then the tension forces kind of have to be the same because we haven't given you the tools to treat them as different. So with that, uh, let me describe the forces. So um, for the hanging mass M, there are two forces on the free body diagram, gravity mg pulling it down, and tension force T uh, pulling it up. For the uh, mass M on the table, there are three forces on the free body diagram, gravity uh, m times g pulling it down, the normal force n supporting it up, and tension force t uh, pulling it to the left. Um, the two tension forces are equal in magnitude. And um, I guess if you miss this next description, it might be fine. Uh, I will also say that the normal force N is equal to mg. Uh, well, but they are not action reaction force pairs. In fact, I don't think there's really action reaction force pair. The, these tensions, they kind of loop around the um, pulley. If we are looking at the force um, on the pulley by the string, then there's a reaction pair that we can consider. But here, no. Um, and you're telling me for that, yeah. Okay. It asks, find the acceleration of the two masses and the tension T in the string if the masses are free to move. And um, let me see. Yeah, and uh, we are never going to deal with the friction force. So let me make this a simplification. I'm going to make this simplification that um, I don't ever have to deal with these vertical forces because... Um, because there's nothing interesting going on there. I'm not going to need to know the normal force in order to figure out the, uh, the friction force. So I'm just going to ignore that um, 
vertical force and make this a completely one-dimensional problem. So I've drawn my free body diagram. That's a step number one. Now step number two, I need to define my coordinate axis so that my positive x-axis in the direction of acceleration, I kind of a sense that my acceleration is in these directions. So I'll say, okay, um, this is my positive x. And for and again, these axes don't have to be the same from object to object. You can uh, make it fit whatever the object you are considering. So here, I'll say my positive x direction is this way. So it's in the same direction as acceleration. That's my step number three that has uh, given me enough annotation on the free body diagram to write down Newton's second law equations. So I need to write it for small mass m and for the big mass m. And with this simplification, my problem is basically one dimensional, so I don't need to consider y and x direction. I can just consider each object one dimensional. So for object m, I have acceleration of the object, which is going to be equal to the net force, mg minus t in the opposite direction, divided by the mass I'm considering. And I need to write down the, my equation for the big mass m. It's going to have the same magnitude of acceleration because of the way they are connected by string. That will be, oh, tension is the only force. Tension divided by big mass m. So I have one, two equations. Let's confirm that I have only two unknowns. This sounds too simple to be true. <laughs> um, I have acceleration that I don't know. In fact, I'm going to find it. Uh, acceleration of masses and attention uh, which I also have to find. And I think that's it. All the other quantities are known. Um, if the is, it doesn't say explicitly that M is known, maybe, but masses are commonly treated as known and I do think I give your answer in terms of given quantities M. So I'll treat masses as known. So two unknowns, two equations, beautiful, we can solve it. Um, it looks like we have one of the quantities already sort of, well, two of them, already solve for acceleration. So let me do this. I'm going to equate these two right-hand sides, and that will give me an expression from which I can solve for tension. So I have uh, this right-hand side, mg minus t over small m is equal to this right-hand side, t over big M. So I need to uh, collect t terms on the same side. Let me uh, do that by... Um, I can multiply both sides by a small m so that I get rid of this and I have t nicely separated here. And then I can um, add both sides with t. That will cancel out t from here and have t on the right hand side. We do those two steps where you are at is left hand side. You should be just left with the mg so far. On the right hand side, I have t small m over big M, small m over big M times t, and then uh, I have this plus t that I'm adding, which cancels out that t on the left side, so I have plus t. Uh, I can factor out t from here, so I have small m over big M plus 1 times t, and I think uh, I'm just one step away from solving for t. Divide both sides uh, by this factor here. Uh, having done that, I get t is equal to small mg over small m over big M plus 1. And you know, there are some simplifications you can do, but I would say oh, this is simple enough. Uh, that's not overly complicated. So if you are submitting this as your answer, t is equal to m times g divided by small m over big M uh, plus 1. That's beautiful, fine answer. And um, it, there are two different ways you can answer for acceleration. You could say, um, a is a t over big M, where t is the same as above, um, which would be considered acceptable in most scenarios, uh, for especially if your expressions get complicated. Here, just because my expressions are kind of simple, let me just uh, do that. My acceleration is that t, uh, so or you know this t, small m over g divided by small m over big M plus one times uh, 1 over big M, 1 over big M. Oh, and I think I can multiply that big M through into the denominator. And when I do that, I cancel this, plus um, 1 times M will give me, uh, for the denominator, small m plus big M. 
that looks beautifully simple. Um, which gives uh, small m is uh, a is equal to small m times g divided by small m plus big M. And it's good to kind of double check your units. Uh, check through a t to make sure that you have unit of force and these are unitless. And check through your unit of acceleration to see that units of masses cancel out and you end up with a unit of acceleration only. So, uh, yeah, I have acceleration and tension. Good. And C, it says, describe how the acceleration and tension change if the positions of the two masses are swapped. Oh, so that's something easy to do if you uh, kind of look at this. And I think this is where it's um, nice to have a simplified form of tension because um, having, so, you know, having tension written in this form, you know, T is equal to small mg over small m over big m plus one it kind of makes the symmetry not quite as manifestly um, obvious so let me do the simplification that i was saying you could have done the way to simplify would be you know get rid of this nested fraction and the way to do it is to multiply by one in such a way that the nested fraction will go away if you multiply top and bottom by big N. This is one, so it doesn't change any of your quantities. And what you end up with is on the numerator, small m times big M times G, and on the denominator, small m plus big M, or, you know, acceleration times big M, which you could have gotten from elsewhere. <laughs> um, so, so this expression actually makes things, um, makes the, um, any changes manifestly clear in that, if you swap the two masses, what you are effectively doing is you are swapping these two parameters. And when you do that swap, you know, multiplication commutes, addition commutes. So this entire expression doesn't change. So you should be able to say, oh, tension doesn't change. It just doesn't. You can see it mathematically. And acceleration does change when you swap. Um, so the denominator won't change. But the numerator, small m will become big M. So uh, acceleration changes to A is equal to some big M times G divided by uh, big M plus small m, uh, which is larger if it's big M is greater than small m. Is it greater than small m? Maybe it doesn't say. Yeah. No. So yeah, this is how they change. Uh, yeah, explain your answer. Uh, See, attach the work of for explanation of T not changing. Um, okay, part D, I think I have five minutes uh, in the original setup in A, is briefly pushed away from the pulley. They seem to move, uh, uh, this is a kinematics. So for part D, um, you start from knowing the acceleration. That's a good starting place. I know my acceleration is mg over small m plus big m from having solved the part b or part a um, the mass is pushed away from the pulley moves a maximum distance of l before it turns what was the initial speed ah so as you think of that description where um, you have a block which was pushed away with some initial speed and it'll come to a rest which means your final velocity is zero and then turn around and during that entire movement, you know your acceleration pointed the leftward is that you have all the information. You are told uh, what distance it moves, L. And as you think through, hopefully you remember enough of the kinematics to remember, ah, V squared formula will give me what I want. I can say V final squared is equal to V initial squared plus two times acceleration times delta X where the relative directions matter. Your acceleration is opposite of your delta x, so you should make sure this product ends up being negative. So with that in mind, let me plug in the quantities that we have. Your v final is zero. Uh, I'm considering this to be turning point to be the final. That's equal to my v initial, which I'm solving for, I think. What was the initial speed? Yeah, v initial squared plus two times let me plug in that acceleration. Let me make that negative. It'll be minus mg over small m plus big M times delta x, which will be plus L. 
you know, right work. Yeah. So, yeah, let me solve for my initial velocity, just doing this algebra in my head. My initial velocity is going to be square root of, you know, move this over, uh, 2 times small mg of L over small m plus big M. And make sure your units come out right, masses cancel, unit of masses cancel, meters per second square times meter, so meters square per second square square root, that gives you meters per second. So let me say initial speed is equal to square root of 2 times m times g times L divided by m plus m. Yeah, that's it. Um, do I have enough time to attach everything? Yeah, I think I do. So, so yeah, that's uh, the setup. And I hope uh, all of this uh, feels familiar to you, especially after the dynamics lab. Um, and, uh, you know, if it doesn't feel familiar to you, it, this uh, um, timed assessment, especially if you get this question, is an excellent opportunity for you to think through it, Try to get as right as you can, and and again you will have some additional time in lab next two week to um, to work through to review through what you submitted, make any corrections, and submit something at the end of the lab for evidence of um, effort work during the lab. Let me just paste this in, and again for you, I recommend that you take some time to organize your work. Don't do what I'm doing. Okay. All right, so uh, let me submit this. Make sure I put in answer everywhere. Make sure I have a work attached and save work and continue. And again, if you discover you have to change your work, this link won't work, but if you simply refresh it or re-access it from modules view, you'll get this add work button that you can use to um, change or add work.